Welcome to the Nutramedical Report, and uh, we have a special show for you today. It's one month exactly after 9-11 on October 11th, uh, 2012, and Dr. Edwards, one of the primary researchers that has researched the issue of the nuclear demolition of the World Trade Center. Uh, I had been doing my research for a while and obtained some, uh, some data on this whole area because I knew that uh, there were a number of anomalies that didn't make sense. And uh, when I got in contact back, oh, it must be five, six years ago, maybe more than that, he is, uh, with Dr. Ed, his data at that time was uh, stunning. And uh, the work that he had done in terms of collecting information on the tritium and World Trade Center 6, uh, the all kinds of anomalies that were present, including... Uh, uh, the uh, micro eddy current anomalies called paramagnetic anomalies caused by an EMP pulse from a nuclear device. Many other anomalies that indicated that there was a nuclear demolition at the World Trade Center, including uh, more than a third of the mass of the building vaporized. Uh, I did further research and uh, got in contact with two nuclear scientists, a high school professor, a teacher uh, with a master's degree in physics who did some analysis of the amount of terajoules of energy required to convert the mass of the building. And the uh, Munitions expert in in uh, Finland that actually had done a uh, uh, proposal to the Port Authority of New York back in 1998 and for the demolition of the World Trade Center towers because they were sick buildings. In fact, I had a discussion just last week with Dr. William Ray, director of the Dallas Environmental Clinic, who treated many people who were sick from New York City, and. Uh, he uh, concurred that the pattern of cancers and the pattern of disease was consistent with exposure to radioisotopes beyond heavy metals, the dioxins and dibenzofurans, because he actually did the testing on these individuals. So, Dr. Ed, you've got some lots of new updates. Let me bring us up to speed in terms of your research on this. I have been repeatedly reporting to the public that I've been testing and trying to test in labs all the way from the Uranium Metal Research Council in Toronto, labs in my alma mater in Dalhousie, which is a sister uh, university at Harvard, uh, testing labs in America and Britain, and they've all not only refused to do the tests, the correct tests, even had did one for me on some debris that I got from one of the people of the uh, downtown New York City where his mother literally was in an apartment across from the World Trade Center, and the dust blew the windows in, and uh, he collected some dust literally on her bed and in her room and sent it to me. And uh, when I sent some of this material off, they did the wrong test, charged me, and I came back and kind of told them off at the laboratory. Uh, and they said, well, if we have to notify of this a special test you want, plasma neutron spectroscopy and advanced isotope analysis, we've already been told in advance to notify the Department of Defense. So uh, this is a very convoluted mess, and it's uh, very hard to get labs, even international ones, to collaborate in doing the testing. Well, so, not only were the, the, the tests inconclusive, uh, they were bogus tests. Uh, the results were, were not consistent with, with what they should have been, and they came up with uh, zero isotopes. But there were other problems that uh, made the data not consistent with World Trade Center dust. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Now, uh, other people have reached a, a wall. We know that there was a group out of Oregon who was actually doing some research for a period of time, and that one got sidelined from the inside. But uh, I've had labs refused in the Canada, the United States, Britain, and last, in last year, uh, Spain, Germany, and Japan, and now I'm trying labs in Russia and China. And also another laboratory in the United States, and I've been communicating with them back and forth, and they keep on acting like they, they don't know what I'm asking for. And the reason why I, I know what to ask is because I've advanced training in radio chemistry, and they try to pretend, oh, you're just Dr. Deagle, MD. I said, no, no, I have advanced radio chemistry training in, in nuclear physics, so don't be asked me. I know what tests I want to order. Yeah, it's it's not going to get done anywhere. I mean, China and Russia and uh, Japan, they've all got satellites up in the air. They all know exactly what temperature was down on the ground, what temperature was up in the World Trade Centers, just like the United States does. They know exactly what happened at the World Trade Centers, but nobody's breaking it. Just in fact, like you, broke the, uh, you broke the information about not only the World Trade Center 6, but the satellite photos that showed the extended temperature even 11 months afterward, the molten metal pools at the bottom with the basically oxygen-poor uh, thermic reactions going on. And these weren't yeah, people, anaerobic. by the way, too. Anaerobic. anaerobic. They, they're covered yeah. by four different fire inhibitors, uh, sand, silicone, uh, uh, chlorine, which is used in halon fire extinguishers. Uh, yeah. 
covered by debris. I mean, there's nothing that can burn in, in those situations. And Dr. Cahill's studies show that there was massive anaerobic, which means without oxygen. Now, in order to have a fire, you have to have 16% oxygen at 1%. This fire burned at, at not 15, not 10%, but 0% oxygen in a, in yeah. a massive chlorine uh, atmosphere. Wow. It can't happen. You can't. And it, the thing is, I hear uh, some other theories, like the Judy Wood theory, that it's due to directed energy weapons. And I'm thinking... I know she had a head injury from an accident, but the information she presents is totally illogical. If there was an external source of energy to strike the building, number one, the ones that I know of require a nuclear-type explosion to generate enough terajoules of energy. Secondly, the building would fall uh, asymmetrically, and it would show signs of being literally hit with an, with a uh, energy beam or a, a directed energy uh, particle beam uh, from well, the outside. So that there's no evidence at all to support the Julie, Judy Wood, you know, exotic energy theory when she has no background or security clearance on uh, directed energy weapons, and she's and this is completely out of her depth of her area of expertise. Well, it, she's not there to find anything. In her own words, she thinks a scientist is supposed to just list a whole bunch of possibilities. That no, his no, job no. is job yeah. is done after you list the possibilities. You don't have to exclude anything. Uh, you don't have to find anything. You well, just, that's you that's just that's list that's a bunch of stuff. Well, that 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 approach and philosophically, again, remember, the, there has to be what I call rigid philosophy of a real good scientist. A good scientist takes every anomaly, which you did, which is why you're a good scientist, and tries to find a single thesis which is called a theory rather than a hypothesis, that could explain all those and then try to go and knock down that thesis or refine it. What she did was the exact opposite. She tried to list every possible uh, alternative way it could happen without any scientific support for either the hypothesis she had yep. or any theory, and they're basically contradictory. Because, for example, as you stated in the past, Thermate is not a counter charge, RDX is. It's used conventionally in, in explosions. And when I hear even the work with Dr. Professor Jones, and I had a big dialogue with him back in 2007, it's too bad you weren't at that meeting uh, in 2007 in Vancouver because I presented your data, my data, and the data from these other people I've been working with anonymously. Anonymous physicist is what his name was, we call him. <laughs> uh, yeah, them, he came up with the 35 nukes, which is just bogus science. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, was the thing I, I tutored I, him. Well, I yeah. tutored his friend Spook, who may yeah, or well, may I, not I, be the I, same I, person. I got, I got another physicist who's a real physicist, and they weren't talking about 35 nukes and whatever. But the key issue is everything that you said lined up with what I found. And again, as a good scientist, which I am also. I look to try to say, okay, if there's one thing that throws this out, you can't consider nukes a reasonable option. There's nothing to suggest directed energy weapons. There's nothing well, to suggest that Thermate was, by in any way, the the, uh, the underlying demolition used in this building. And the amount of Thermate you'd have to have, so even Super Thermate, which is only, by the way, made in Israel, would never explode or take giant girder six feet across with two inches of asbestos and turn into an atomic vapor. Yeah, there's nothing that can do what was done in the amount of time, such as turning all that steel to vapor, turning molten, multiple uh, uh, molten steel reports, as well as some videos uh, that, that show it's uh, massive smoldering. And uh, don't put, the guy telling them, don't pour water on, on this. Uh, we want to try and get it up without all that steam coming up. Uh, they never do show the picture of it coming up, but you, you can tell there's there's super heat coming in below. Yeah, let's go through systematically all your work because you've done a, an amazing job and you continue to chew on that bone of uh, the World Trade Center nukes over the years and it's important to get an update from Dr. Ed Ward and we've got all his links and blogs up and it lines up with all the data that we have as well. Thanks.
Welcome back to the New Dramatic Report. And, uh, Dr. Ed, let's go through this systematically. Uh, you've got some really good links uh, that we want to discuss here today in terms of lots of issues. You know, the issue of both thermate, superthermate, uh, all kinds of issues dealing with the World Trade Center demolition. And, and, of course, this was a self-inflicted wound by special operations inside the government. I have from my sources, this is the thesis that I bring, is that there's an integration between uh, elements of the Saudi and the Israeli and the CIA and the secret agencies, the, even the French, uh, as you mentioned, that were all present or knew about what was going on. The number of people that were killed in the World Trade Center death, uh, demolition was only roughly 3,000 when if that was fully, if there, the, all the floors were full of people and the mall between them and, and building number six were populated properly as a normal day, there would be many times that that would have died. So something was war a warning was put out not to be there and not to fly there in, in this area. And you've got some insights on that as well as the demolition issue. Let's go through all of this. Well, uh, I mean, it's it's well known that uh, what Condi Rice was warned away. Uh, she sent letters to she sent emails to people. Uh, there were you know uh, that it wound up that only one Israeli was killed in the World Trade Center. Supposedly, who knows if that's true? Uh, it's it's you know it's it's not a coincidence that France kept, happened to be there to be filming that. Uh, yeah, it's not uh, coincidence at all, is it? Yeah. Yeah, it, you know, all these people, the dancing Israelis, happen to be there filming. You know, and it, it, it's just too many coincidences. But uh, let's. Uh, I want to, we'll talk a little bit about uh, you talked about uh, Judy Woods and the different weapons and not only would they, they have to work, they would have to work in ways that they don't work. In other words a laser is going to have trouble once it starts into a, a, a massive dust cloud Well, well it, it would be it diffracted can't, It can't it burn through, through the outs it can't not burn through the outside of something and burn something in the middle same thing for microwaves they have to go through you can't have them go through stuff and then all of a sudden focus in the core well There's yeah exactly not only that yeah and even a directed energy weapon where you're dealing with high energy particles or a plasma uh it would be diffracted by the debris that would be generated in the first place right it, it, that first of all it's, it, it's going to light up that that whatever it's hitting and vaporize it, you're going to see it going through. Right. It, it's, there's no way to hide it. There's no way to power it. There's no way that it can do as much mass as what was there. I mean, we had three billion pounds of building turned into two billion pounds of micronized dust. We have massive craters, uh, 200 feet wide around World Trade Center 1, 2, and a uh, giant hole in World Trade Center 6 that's 40 foot deep. You know, you got five acres of land at 1,800 degrees in a matter of seconds. 1.2 billion pounds of residue was, was what was left, and which is coincidentally about the mass of five to seven acres. Uh, that was... Uh, Don Fox, uh, you're talking about Vancouver, they did a pretty good uh, presentation. They used pretty much almost all my information except for what I, uh, I, I wrote to him. Uh, we have a nice discussion on his uh, WordPress uh, site. Uh, Don Fox uh, on WordPress, I'm on WordPress too. Uh, it's a good place to uh, find all of my information with updated links, which many, many have been cut or are uh, turned to, into uh, uh, just useless information. Uh, you know, we have the impossible fire that burns in anaerobic conditions. Uh, the, the building that's... Uh, we've well, got 16-inch spires. These are 16-inch thick steel spires that withstood half a billion pounds of building falling on them. And then all of a sudden, they start, you know, in a few seconds, they start getting wobbly and fall down. Nothing's, nothing's pushing down on them. They just suddenly get wobbly. There's only one thing in the world that can do that, and that's massive neutron influx. 
They come right. in, they start getting it hot, and, and it's still getting hot as they're going through. And it takes a little bit of time for that heat to disperse in the metal because uh, it, you know, steel's just a basic heat sink, and there's nothing else that can do it, what neutrons do to steel. Exactly. Yeah, they do an, an interesting annealing effect. They also change the crystal structure because metal is a paracrystalline liquid. Most people think that, li that steel is solid, but it's in a sense a paracrystalline liquid that moves very slowly, so is glass. And when you change the neutron structure, you lose that laminar uh, crystallized structure that gives it strength, uh, and it can literally start to flow or vaporize, turn into a vapor phase. And any of that steel that shows sign of being melted or uh, being subjected to massive heat, like uh, in, in my first, my second article, uh, mm -hmm. there's like this six-inch thick I-beam that is in a perfect horseshoe. This is six inches thick steel that's bent an I-beam that's bent in a horseshoe. All of that is going to show, and every bit of steel is going to show stable isotopes from the neutron influx. Those are going to be exactly. there for decades, for hundreds of years. Yeah, in fact, uh, one of the tests that I requested each of these labs, and they kind of freaked out when I asked it because I wouldn't tell where it was coming from, is I wanted to look for stable, non-radioactive isotopes due to neutron influx. And, they, whoa, what are you asking that for? I said, hey, I'm, just, I'm just sending you a sample. I want to look for these stable, non-radioactive isotopes. One of the best ones is iron-58, which doesn't occur naturally except if it's exposed to a nuclear uh, flux due to neutrons from a nuclear explosion. Period. Yeah, but isotopes is a nail, but it's just only it's just one nail. There are many, many nails oh. that put the coffin in you. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, in the World Trade Center, one of the ones that you picked up on was the paramagnetic effect of aluminum on the back of mirrors of the uh, firefighting equipment, the plenum chambers and the air conditioning units. The uh, paramagnetic effect, of course, is what allows your analog uh, disc to spin to tell you how much power you're utilizing. But that those eddy currents, if there's a mesh of surge, can blow out, uh, these repeaters for cell phone tower repeaters that are in that part of, of New York City because there was a wide zone of destruction of cell phone tower repeaters in that area as well as plenum chambers, mirrors, and also aluminized uh, uh, engine blocks and other things, including the wheel wells that had aluminum in them. You picked up on that, and uh, we could see it line of sight. It was actually almost like a electromagnetic pulse that came out of the building. Uh, you picked up on the uh, World Trade Center 6, the 55 times tritium levels that were in the U.S. geological data, and some of the other isotopes that indicated that they're using advanced demolition uh, technologies uh, as well. Back in just a moment with Dr. Ed Ward, a remarkable update on what's going on with our investigations of the World Trade Center 6 nuke demolition. That was the technology utilized by our government in collaboration with Israeli and Saudi and other intelligence forces. Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and uh, let's go through some of these other uh, major issues. Uh, one of the ones uh, that I think that was very interesting, because I got parallel data from my sources that the aircraft that did strike the building, there were jets, this whole idea there were no jets, it was also foolishness. If anybody knows anything about JPA jet fuel, it maximum fuel in the nozzle of a high, of a high combustion mixed fuel jet engine is 1600 degrees so it's kerosene it's not going to burn very fast basically unless you have a special nozzle it cannot do any of the chemical things or energetic things like vaporizing you know girders or causing the building to blow up in fact there were people standing in the holes of the building immediately after the so-called impact the other thing is there were video that showed that these were not American airline jets and you're one of the first to actually pick up on this or others as well that looked at this issue let's talk about this because there were no windows in flight 175 right we, we know that from my sources and I had military I had classified sources that contacted me that these jets were flown in by uh, a process called Global Hawk and there were pods underneath the jets 
my sources told me that they actually were refurbished in Fort Collins, Colorado, specifically for this operation. And uh, Global Hawk, by the way, has been a system that's been in operation uh, operationally in one form or another in commercial airline jets since the 70s, supposedly to take over a jet and fly it remotely in case of, quote, a hijacking. But they've been doing this for a long time. And the other thing is the, aer- uh, the, the aer- uh, aeronautical properties of these jets could not, quote, thread the needle, which is a process that I was told when I was one of the doctors yeah. for Air Force Academy. They couldn't possibly strike those buildings with the the velocity they came. They wouldn't have enough control. So yeah, they fall, had to have one, a beacon inside apart the building. they break up. And yeah. uh, two, they just, it's not possible to do it, even if you're a highly experienced uh, Yeah, I had, I, I had, most have said. I, I had pilots they, tell me, or Top Gun pilots tell me it was impossible. These jets... Uh, there had to be beacons in the building, and they had to be flown by some kind of computer remote system. There's no way that these commercial airliners were there. And also the pictures of the videos show that there were no windows. These were not American Airlines jets. God knows where they went, what they did, if they flew them somewhere else. But they were not. They were not uh, American Airlines jets that flew into those right, buildings. I, I have an article, um, uh, fake video stars. Uh, actually, it's called 9-11 fake video stars. Uh, you can yeah. Google just fake st- fake video stars, and it'll come up. And it's it's why uh, covert ops has to have uh, these no planes and um, the videos are fake because they show exactly what would have been needed to fly into the World Trade Center. A commercial windowed pl- uh, jetliner will not be able to do it. Right. But, but the J-Star clones, uh, the J-Star 10s, there's a series of them. They all have the pods. They all look uh, the swept back wing tips. They look exactly like what the video shows. Yeah, exactly. So the only way to, to kind of refute that is to say, oh, we got fake, we got fake videos. That video is not true. Well, the video is true because they show the exact plane that would be needed to do the job. A souped up commercial airliner with no windows, with uh, special features on it, and and uh, more structure and more power. Right. And actually to go to that velocity too. Now, this is really important because we know that the buildings were hardened to a kinetic energy of a 707 back in the 1970s when they built right. these and buildings. Was, now, they want to tell you that the 767 is, is, is oh, it's heavier. Uh, there's no comparison. Well, if you take the 707 uh, mass and, and use the speed that it attained, which was more than a 767, and you do the calculations, there's very little difference in the mass energy strike yeah. building between yeah, the kinetic a 707 energy is, fully fueled right. and a 767. Yeah. Right. So in other words, the kinetic energy is virtually identical. So, And these were designed, by the way, like a bug screen so that if the outside of the building was hit, it wasn't the supporting the building from the outside like many buildings from girders on the outside. It was supported from the central column and in the inside, which means they had to vaporize the central column to collapse the building. They couldn't just blow the outside joists, as Professor Jones says. They had to vaporize the central column, which literally supported the primary mass of the building. Absolutely, and and there's these things are so huge and and so massive that the only thing that can do it, I mean, you could stick torches on a, on a piece of steel <laughs> for hours. And then it's not going to take the whole piece of steel and, and turn it into a U-beam. The only no. thing that can do that in a matter of seconds, which is exactly what you see, because the building falls in a, in a matter of seconds, the only thing that can do that is neutron uh, activation. And it's yeah. always going to leave a fingerprint. Uh, it, and uh. it left radioactive isotopes, but probably in 11 years, a lot of those are gone. But the stable isotopes are going to be there forever. Yeah, the stable isotopes, yeah. And a lot, a lot of them are long-acting isotopes, too, that will be there for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and that's why we know there's debris. I'm sure that people have it on their mantle. We have these steel pieces that were sitting well, for a long I time at Kennedy Airport. I nobody has it on their mantle unless it's sealed. This, this stuff is dangerous. Even now. You know, we lost Janet. 
You heard of Janet? Janet McKinley, who oh, yes. sent me the sample of the World Trade Center dust. Oh, yeah. She died of a brain tumor in 2010. Right. You know, you know, and there are going to be more that follow. There are more, more ahead of her and more are going to follow because that's what's classic in radiation. Every part of the body is hit, and every type of cancer is possible. Uh, in particular, they were, when I wrote uh, this, my second article, Update to U.S. Government Nukes, um, there were 14 testicular cancers found. And that was, again, that's like seven years ago, five, well, uh, five years ago for that article. And the only thing that, that's known to cause testicular cancer, the only cause that's known is radiation. You know, that's but, unfortunate you're a doctor. You can actually figure that out and know the references. Well, yeah, you know, when they say, like, oh, asbestos did it. Well, asbestos may do mesotheliomas, but it doesn't do anything else. No, it really uh, may, it might prepare your sinuses to make them get an infection with aspergillosis or something else, but it's primarily a mesothelioma. Right. It causes no other cancers. And the same yeah. thing with other things that are there. They have to, to not only... Uh, be a, a toxin or a, uh, a cancer-causing uh, chemical, but they also have to get to the point where the cancer is found. Now, now, there's nothing that can get to the whole body, every part of the body, and produce every kind of radiate, uh, every type of cancer except radiation. Every all these other things like dioxin, who are our uh, Vietnam soldiers literally swam in sometimes in the bottom of foxholes. They were sitting down in it. And they all got denied. In it. You know, that was all in their heads when they were sick or when their children had deformities. And that's the main way that dioxin comes around, comes around uh, for cancers. It shows up in children. But, you know, it'll do some other stuff, too, but you, you still, it has to get to where it's going. If, it, yeah. if you're breathing it in, well, it's going to show damage, you know, it should do damage in the lungs before anywhere else. That's where your main concentration yeah. is. What, but, you know, you don't get, it shouldn't give you brain cancer if you breathe it in. Right. In fact, the pattern of cancers, and I talked to Dr. Ray as little as two weeks ago, and he told me the same thing. I <laughs> uh, want to go over some interesting facts going back and rolling back to history. One of their gentlemen that was on the program uh, some years ago is Tom Scott Gordon, a photographer. He was contracted in 1988 to do a special photography of the entire World Trade Center complex in Port Authority, New York. And when we come back, we'll talk about that and some other amazing anomalies. But yeah, the cancer pattern is not consistent with just heavy metals and debris from a building. It's consistent with radiation exposure and radioisotopes. Dr. Ed, let's go into some of the structure because uh, you had an analysis of the of the U.S. geological data. In fact, it's interesting that the U.S. geological actually, in a sense, put the in the data that they presented that was never properly analyzed by the 9/11 Commission. The actual isotopes that could indicate that a micronuke was used, uh, you know, isotopes such as beryllium, uh, lithium deuteride, etc. Uh, these are kind of really interesting, uh, and the the presence of exotic technology to allow these to be the size of a softball, literally. Because you know back in the 50s we had the uh, Davy Crockett battlefield nuke that was never deployed. It was tested, but it was really what they found is that they can shoot it, but the people that were shooting it were actually within the blast zone that could have be either affected or seriously damaged by the weapon. So well, not a good weapon to have. Yeah, it, it had some problems, although I do have uh, a video of the uh, the uh, first uh, micro-nuke testing in, in uh, I believe it's update to U.S. government, um, and uh, it shows them moving in right afterwards, uh, and, and in particular, I have a quote from Cohen, he gives a lot of information in his article, Shame, I'll just, I'm going to read you're this. About, you're talking about, uh, you, uh, we want to refer, who is Cohen? Cohen is the guy 
who invented and sensed the neutron bomb. Right, and Mitra, Mr. Neutron uh, Bomb. Right, now, by the way, people need to know that Mr. Cohen has written a lot of things to indicate that micronukes, in a sense, are neutron bombs. Uh, uh, and, right. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, even the bigger ones are now neutron bombs. And right. I'm going to read this little statement he wrote. That uh, Cohen points out that neutron bomb doesn't have the collateral damage of fallout, blast, and heat effects that occurred in Hiroshima. It, but enhanced neutron flash radiation. In about a thousandth of a second, it will be seriously irradiating enemy soldiers, tanks, self-propelled. Uh, for this is for a kiloton for about a half a mile. Right. But these are these are way smaller than a kiloton, right? Uh, and and uh, he says uh, uh, there will be no lingering radioactivity, except for residual doses from neutron-induced activity in soil, uh, insin insignificant compared to the flash dose of neutrons. Right. And it decays quickly, uh, and can be re-entered almost immediately. Yeah, exactly, yeah, which is interesting, which is good for battlefield. Now, the list of isotopes, some of them sure are long-acting, that we were able to, to pull together is beryllium-9, polonium-210 with a 138-day half-life, which is a neutron trigger, uranium-238, yttrium, uh, lithium deuteride, or what they call red mercury, polonium-239, plutonium-239, that is, which is a, a detonator called a fuse, um, uh, well, uranium-237 uh, and 235, strontium-90 and iridium, and, of course, the tritium, which uh, you presented the data that's 55 times background. After 120 million liters of fire suppression water hosed down the World Trade Center, according to their own analysis, and, of course, we'd also be looking for iron-57, iron-58, which are heavy uh, isotopes, and the radioactive iron-59. The iron-58, by the way, would be the most stable long-acting isotope that will still be present hundreds of millions of years from now. It will not radio decay. Right. Oh, there's plenty of evidence there. It's just finding somebody who can do it. Yeah. Yeah, and you had the data here. I presented it in my slides when I presented this in June of, of 2007 at, in, in Vancouver, which is the data that you had, which is silicon... Uh, uh, tw 28 carbon 12 sulfur 32 iron 56 iron uh, uh, iron uh, yeah, uh, I, nickel I 58 a little, a little list of what to look for uh, I just don't have right. it handy right now uh, yeah, I have it in the, in the slides but people if they go over to clay and iron they can actually just pull up the video pull up the uh, the PowerPoint because it's it's right there uh, so they can have a look at these and it all indicates that uh, in, in advanced exotic neutron type weapon or a chain I call a chain of pearls of these was used down the center of the building uh, so many floors to actually vaporize the core and cause it to literally have a free fall which means there was no kinetic resistance between the floors like the pancake theory which would have mean even if the building was collapsing from any other technology just pancaking would have slowed the fall considerably when one floor smacks into another and the transfer of kinetic energy would slow the fall to the ground well, yeah, in my first article, I show uh, a ten-story building that collapsed on itself, and and you see none of this fine micronization. You see like ten slabs of falling down on themselves, which is is what you expect to find from a non-demolition -dem uh, uh, structure failure. Right. Yeah, pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, there's nothing else that that does everything in in that short period of time, except the nuke. Yeah, and, and let's go through some of the anomalies that you've presented, and I've expanded on them too. Sub superheated uh, steel beams created steel vapor comet trails while falling. Sub 100 micron pulverized a, of 99 percent of the concrete, so they weren't big chunks like a regular demolition. 330 yeah, tons sections. All of like 50 microns to, and, and smaller for the most part. Right. Uh, uh, three, yeah, 330 ton sections of the outer wall columns ripped off. Ponds of molten metal in the basement of World Trade Center 1, 2, and 7. By the way, 7 supposedly wasn't even hit, which is really ridiculous. Well, uh, then. 7, I'm not so sure that was uh, from, from a nuke. 1, I could never find uh, a, a cloud coming out. That would be consistent with a new. But they had. They must use some kind it, of exotic demolition of some kind. Uh, th I think they just use regular straight demolition on it. But the, yeah, the like heat residual there is from the World Trade Center that's closest to it, 
when all that stuff comes flying out of it, I think that went over to World Trade Center 7 because I, I, I never really found any indication of a nuke except for that heat, and it didn't last as long as World Trade Center 1 or 2. Yeah, and so it's, it, it, it's a different kind of technology, perhaps. The other thing was a picture, which is up in the PowerPoint, of the 9-11 World Trade Center meteor that was actually housed in a hangar at the Kennedy Airport hangar for years. Uh, I'm not sure where that ended up. The LiDAR infrared imaging, you were the first to actually pick up the LiDAR imaging uh, information that showed this. There was 100 days required to cool the building debris down in the pyroplastic uh, massive plumes of debris, flow of debris with a tail chimney rising upward. People, computers, and furniture by disappeared because people, computers, and furniture vanished, but paper remained. And the reason is people, computers, and furniture were paramagnetic. In other words, they transferred the electromagnetic energy in the X-rays uh, from a neutron weapon, the neutrons, basically into the superheated vapor. So literally, people burst at 50,000 degrees into into steam, and concrete would burst into steam, creating the micro nanoparticles. Right, uh, the steam steam helps to help break all those particles apart. That's the, yeah, the method. Yeah, the other thing is 20% of the World Trade Center dust is made of metals in atomic sizes, which is really an unusual. World Trade Center well, One transmission said, tower. Everybody in New York that was around it said the the smell of metal. You know, the only way you can get metal is to like vaporize it to get that smell. Right, they smell it across New Jersey. I had people years later tell me they can smell New Jersey. World Trade Center One transmission tower falls first, indicating central support was removed. And um, <clears throat> witnesses say cars exploded and burned out wrecks that had not been hit by debris. And wide power outage cut off all communications, a very large area, including burning out these uh, aluminum, aluminized, which would, of course, pick up paramagnetic currents from the EMP pulse uh, in the area. And uh, it was weird. There was paper blown everywhere. The winter garden was hit by a 22-ton uh, st steel uh, piece that was ejected 600 feet. Sharp spikes of seismograph near the Lamont Doherty earthquake lab. And, we've, of course, we've had the reports that there were uh, some kind of device in the basement of the building that actually blasted upward that tore the skin off one individual that, uh, uh, you remember, our, who, I'm trying to remember our gentleman that was at, running the uh, elevators there. Uh, name no, Mrs. Uh, Mary. I, I don't remember his name either. I know you're talking yeah, about Yeah, quite famous. And what happened is he actually saw an individual before the so-called major strikes of the building. There was some kind of explosion a matter of seconds before the brown shades of color in the air due to nuclear radiation from sulfuric acid, the huge expanding dust cloud taking five times volume of the tower, uh, and of course, if you look at these uh, a seismographic record from Palisades, New York, rubble height only 10% of the original consists of 33% of normal demolition. No survivors found for one isolated stairway without over uh, without overhead debris, and decontamination procedure seen at WTC with high pressure water spraying. Rooftop, 200,000 gallon water tanks for sprinkler system, but no water in ruins. None. So it must have been turned to a vapor. And uh, forensic toxicology of trace metals and isotopes found at the scene of the nuclear demolition. Beryllium tritium, as Dr. Ward has found. Cancers of rare types, secondary to radiation and nanoparticles, heavy metals and radioisotopes. Fibrotic lung conditions, and you mentioned tritium, which triggers this. So fibrotic lung conditions. Uh, amazing. We need to have some further analysis of this. Check it all out. Check out the links we have to Dr. Ward's sites and his blogs. We're not giving up on pursuing the truth.